Last week, I began a new sermon series on the subject of prayer, and more specifically, on the Lord's Prayer. So if you would, turn with me to the book of Matthew, chapter 6. We're going to read verses 5 through 13. And if you were here last week, you probably remember that we weren't in Matthew, chapter 6. We actually read the Lord's Prayer in Luke, chapter 11. So... You're pretty smart. You guess that it's actually recorded in both books. The reason we're going to Matthew chapter 6 is because Jesus said some other things about prayer that I want to look at before we start studying the Lord's Prayer. So follow along with me as I read Matthew chapter 6, verses 5 through 13. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. For they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. But thou, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou hast shut thy door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do, for they think that they shall be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. After this manner, therefore pray ye, Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, before we jump in and start studying the Lord's Prayer, let's see what Jesus said before that. Because actually, he's giving us some great advice if we'll only take it. So look at verse number 5 again. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets, that they may be seen of men. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward. Now that's kind of sad because the implication is the reward is not answered prayer. The reward is that they're seen by men. But let's go a little bit further. I want you to notice that Jesus, in Jesus' opening words, he makes it very clear that he takes for granted that his disciples are going to pray. He said, and when thou prayest, which implies that he expects us to pray. So if you're not praying, you're not living up to God's expectations. But he also expects our prayers to be sincere and from the heart. That's why the first thing that Jesus addresses concerning prayer is hypocrisy. Notice the clause, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are. Now, I want you to underline the word hypocrites. Hypocrites is translated from the Greek word hypocrites. And if you notice, it sounds alike. So we could go a little bit further, and we could say that the English word hypocrite is actually transliterated from this Greek word. Now, a hypocrites was the Greek word for actor. And an actor is someone who pretends to be someone or something he's not. And that's exactly what a hypocrite is. A hypocrite is someone who pretends to be someone or something he's not. Now, there's one particular characteristic that all hypocrites have. And what do you think that is? All hypocrites love an audience. They want an audience. You see, acting is no fun unless there's someone watching you. So notice in verses 2, 5, and 16 how religious hypocrites try to draw attention to themselves. This is the same chapter, chapter 6. We're talking about the same thing, which is prayer, but in particular, we're talking about hypocrisy in prayer. So notice verses 2, 5, and 16. Here's verse number 2. Therefore, when thou doest thine alms, do not sound a trumpet before thee, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may have glory of men. Verily I say unto you, they have the reward. Now, I want you to know that they didn't actually carry a trumpet and go, Whoa. They were referred to as trumpets, but they would make a show of putting it in, making sure everyone knew that they were putting this in. They wanted to draw people's attention. Now, look in Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, same chapter. And when thou prayest, thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and the corner streets, that they may be seen of men. They want to make sure that they're seen by everyone. Now look at verse 16. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward." They actually disfigured their faces. They, I, I'm trying to imagine in my mind how they disfigured their faces to show that they were fasting. But I'm sure they probably spent a lot of time looking at their reflection, trying to figure out what looked the best. 
I don't know. But gee, that's what they were trying to do because they wanted everyone to know what they were doing. Now, let's be honest. We have a lot of hypocrites in the church today, and they're easy to spot. They're the ones that want a ministry that's highly visible. And if it's not highly visible, they don't want to do that. They're the ones that look for a church that will let them minister in the spotlight. I'll be honest with you, when we first began, we were very small. We actually started with 12 people in our church, and then we quickly grew a little bit and went to a storefront, and then from a storefront to a little big church on 4th Street, and then to the old National Guard Armory that was on Water Street, and then we actually had our services in the PAC, and finally we came here. Now, when we first started, I want you to understand our definition of excellence is totally different than what our definition of excellence is today. Because excellence simply means doing the best you can with what you have. And when we first started, we didn't have any talent. And I'm sorry if you're one of the 12 people that were with us in the very beginning. But we didn't have any talent, including myself. And as a result of that, you'll let anyone lead worship. And I'm telling you, we had some bad worship. But now, today, we have quite a few people that we can select from. And as a result of that... You actually have to go through an audition to be able to play an instrument on our worship team or to actually sing in our worship team. And you think, an audition? I can't believe it. But let me explain why. Some people shouldn't be singing on stage. And if they can't sing on stage, then they're going to go to a small church where they can sing on stage. And I'm not saying anything about small, sta or small churches. And the reason I'm not saying anything bad about small churches is because the Bible says, despise not small beginnings. And that was my favorite verse when we first started the church. Despise not small beginnings. But anyways, I want you to realize that some people will leave a church because they realize they're not going to have an opportunity to be in some type of ministry that's highly visible. You see, what they really want to do is to perform. And a performance isn't fun unless there's spectators, unless there's people watching. That's why they want to be in the spotlight. Now, in verse 5, Jesus told us what hypocrites love to do when it comes to prayer. He said, they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men. In other words, they want to capitalize on every possibility to grab the limelight because in their mind, the world is a stage and it's a chance to perform. So if there's an opportunity to perform, they can't help it. They go into character and they begin performing as an actor. It's just who they are. Now, because of the way that the Jews worshipped in Jerusalem at the time of Christ, hypocrites had the perfect opportunity to flaunt their stuff. Yeah. You see, Judaism required all Jews to pray three times a day at specific times. There's a reason when you're studying the book of Daniel, and it talks about Daniel prayed three times a day. It's because they were required to pray three times a day. And the reason they did is because of the sacrifices. So they were required to pray three times a day at specific times. They were supposed to pray at the third hour, which is 9 a.m., the time of the morning sacrifice. Now, if you're wondering why that's referred to as the third hour, you need to understand that the Jews would break the day, and I'm not talking about the 24-hour day, but the daytime in which the sun is out into a 12-hour period. The sun normally came out somewhere around 6 o'clock in the morning. And so they divided it up into one twelfth, or in other words, hours. So the first hour would be 6 o'clock in the morning, the second hour, 7, and so you're going on, and you can see this. But actually, and I started Rome at 7, 8, Nine, get that right. But anyways, the third hour is 9 a.m. And that was, the morning, that was the time of the morning sacrifice. So in the temple at this time, they were offering a sacrifice. And as the priests were offering the sacrifice, the Jews were not supposed to be going on with their daily business. No, they were supposed to be in this reverent time because at the temple, the priests are now offering the morning sacrifices for all of the people. And therefore, all of the people were supposed to be in prayer. They were also supposed to pray at the sixth hour, which was 12 o'clock noontime, the time when they brought the second lamb out that was going to be offered at three o'clock, and they tied it to the altar. This was a time for you to kind of have reflection. So you would stop and you would pray at the ninth hour, or the uh, sixth hour, which is 12 o'clock. And then they were supposed to pray at the ninth hour, which was three o'clock in the afternoon. That was the time of the evening sacrifice. That's when they were now taking that lamb that had been tied up at 12 noon, and they were now offering him to God. So the Jews prayed three times a day. Now, can you imagine the power this could have produced? 
a whole nation corporately praying at the same time every day and not just once, but three times a day? Can you imagine what America would be like if everyone believed in the one God? And they also believed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the son of that one God who came and died for us and God raised him from the dead. Can you imagine what it would be like if three times a day we stopped and everyone in America from an earnest heart, from a sincere heart began to pray? Can you imagine the power that would have produced? But instead of it being a sincere time of prayer, it became a performance. Yeah. The hypocrites used it as a time to perform. In fact, it gave them the perfect opportunity to use the synagogues and the street corners as their own personal stage. You see, because the morning prayers and the evening prayers coincided with the sacrifices in the temple, a trumpet would blow to signify that it was time for these sacrifices to be made, but also it was a time for all the people to stop, turn towards the temple, face the temple in Jerusalem, and begin to pray. So the hypocrites would actually try to time it so that they would be on the streets when the trumpet, trumpets blew. In fact, they tried to time it so that they would be on the exact street they wanted to be on when these trumpets would sound. And when the trumpet sounded, they would stop, they would turn, and they would face the temple. And then they would begin to put their phylacteries on. Anyone ever watched a Jew do that? They take that strap with the box on it, and there's a specific way that they wrap it around the right arm, and when they get it there, then they take the phylactery with the little box of the parchment, the Shema inside, and they placed it on their forehead. And then they would take their prayer shawl, and they would place it over their head, and they would begin to recite the Shema. Now, if you grew up like me, pastors pronounced it Shema. How many of you grew up hearing pastors refer to the Shema? Well, that's what I grew up hearing. And then when I went to Israel and started listening to Jews, they refer to it as the Shema. So I'm not trying to be spiritual when I do that. I'm just trying to pronounce it the way that the Jews do. Now, the Shema had three parts to it. The first part is more about our responsibilities as children of God. And the first part is Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. So after they turned and they faced the temple... And they put on their phylacteries and they pulled over their prayer shawl. They would begin to recite the first part of the Shema, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. This is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, you notice anything interesting about that word Lord? You should. It's all capital letters, right? And if you've been coming to our teaching on the book of Amos, you know that whenever you see the word Lord in all capital letters, that means it's translated from the Hebrew word Yahweh. That is the redeeming covenant-keeping name of God. Only the Jews had that type of relationship with God. He was their father. He brought them out of Egypt and created them into a nation, so he was the father of Israel. He had a covenant with them. He was the redeeming, covenant-keeping name of God, and they were to refer to him as Yahweh, but they weren't supposed to take the name in vain, so the majority of the time they didn't pronounce it. Now, when you translate it into English, it's Jehovah. Jehovah and Yahweh are the same thing. It's just that we're saying it in English. So let's keep reading. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. Yeah, that's the greatest commandment. Remember when the lawyer asked Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Well, he actually came to the first part of the Shema. You shall love the, your, the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your heart your spirit with everything within you. And then he goes further. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto your children and shalt talk of them when you sit in thine house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. And you shall bind them for a sign upon thy hand. Now we get to the phylacteries. And they shall be as frontlets between the eyes. That's why they wear the phylacteries. Even today, when you go to Jerusalem and you go to the temple, before you go up on the temple mount, you go to the Welling Wall, you will see these Jews there and they're putting on their phylacteries to pray. It's good to be there at 9 o'clock, it's good to be there at 12 o'clock, and it's good to be there at 3 o'clock. Because that's when the Orthodox Jews really come out. They still keep this. And then he goes further. And thou shalt write them upon the post of thy house and on thy gates. Now here's what's interesting. This is why they have a mezuzah. 
How many of you ever seen in a Jewish home, they've got this little box. It's usually about a half inch to three quarter inches wide. And it's about three and a half inches long. And it's fastened to the doorpost. And inside that is a piece of parchment that has the Shema written on it. And whenever a Jew walks into the house, what do they do? They kiss it and touch it. When they walk out, they kiss it and touch it. Because this is the word. And they're supposed to do what? Write them upon the post of thy house. And that's what they've done. Part two is basically the same thing as part one with one exception. It states the rewards, the promises, but also a warning if you don't keep God's commandments. So after they quoted the first part of the Shema, they went right into the second part of the Shema. And it's Deuteronomy chapter 11 verses 13 through 21. Let's read it. And it shall come to pass, if you shall hearken diligently unto my commandments, which I command you this day, to love the Lord God your God, and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul, that I will give you the rain of your land in his due season, the first rain and the latter rain, that thou mayest gather in thy corn, what a rich reward, and thy wine and thy oil, these are the promises. And I will send grass in thy fields for thy cattle, and thou mayest eat and be full. Take heed to yourselves that your heart be not deceived. This is the warning. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. And then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain, that your land yield not her fruit, lest you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord gives you. Therefore shall you lay up these my words in your heart and in your soul, and bind them for a sign upon your hand, phylacteries, and they may be a frontlet between your eyes, the one on your foreheads, the phylactery. And ye shall teach them to your children, speaking of them which thou sittest in thine house. And when thou walkest by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. And you shall write them upon the doorpost of thine house and upon thy gates, the mezuzah. That your days may be multiplied in the days of your children in the land which the Lord swear unto your fathers to give them as the day of heaven upon the earth. And then you come to the third part of the Shema. This states our responsibility again, our grave responsibility to keep the commandments of the Lord. This is found in the book of Numbers, chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout their generations, and that they put upon the fringes of the borders a ribbon of blue. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it, remember all the commandments of the Lord, and do them. Sometime I'll bring out this and I'll explain what the different knots mean and why they do it, but today they still do that. It's wonderful to go to Jerusalem and to see these Orthodox Jews coming in, some with prayer shawls, some taking this a different way depending upon where they've come when they immigrated to Israel. But they all have these little uh, tassels that are coming down, and they're tied in knots in a specific way to remind them of the Lord's commandments. And then he goes further. And that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you shall go to a whoring, that you may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. I am the Lord, your God, the redeeming covenant-keeping God. I'm in covenant with you. I am the Lord, your God, which brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. I am the Lord, your God. Now, what a shame. Because this time, a corporate prayer could have been so powerful, but instead it was impotent because it was perverted by their hypocrisy. You see, they weren't praying earnestly with a sincere heart. No, they were putting on a show. So people could see how religious they were. They were timing it so that they could be on the busiest streets where the majority of their neighbors would be so they would be able to see how religious they were and how observant they were to God's word and then they would put these phylacteries on this, this prayer shawl would go over their head and then they would recite the Shema word for word. Now most of you don't know this but before... Uh, you actually became a son of the commandment. You had your bar mitzvah. You were required to memorize the Shema because that's what you were supposed to pray three times a day. You actually turned this passage of Scripture, these three parts of the Shema, into a prayer. Now look at verse number 6. Same chapter, Matthew chapter 6, verse 6, very next verse. But thou, when you pray... Enter into your closet, and when thou hast shut the door, pray to thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which seeth in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, this verse explains how to keep your prayer time from being perverted by hypocrisy. And it's really quite simple. You pray in a closet. 
Now, this doesn't mean what most of us think it means. So let me explain what it means to pray in a closet. First of all, I want you to underline that word closet in verse number 6. That word is translated from the Greek word temion. And temion simply means inner room. So in essence, it can refer to any inner room that offers privacy. So don't think of it as a closet. Think of it as any room that offers privacy. When I pray here at the church, when I come during the week, this is my closet right here. From that wall there to this wall here. Lisa and I normally get here before anyone else does. So we normally open the gate. We actually come in and I turn the alarm off. And then I come in here and I begin to pray. It's an inner room. It's a private room. And I have all this time to pray until our staff begins to get here. And even then when they get here, sometimes if they're a little noisy in there in that hallway and they don't go straight to their offices, then I go over there and I shut that door. I leave that door open so I'll have a little light because I like to pray in the dark. And I want to make sure that I don't run into that wall or that wall. Because I'm a walker. For me to concentrate, I need to be walking, and I pray with my eyes open. But I begin to pray, and I begin to get into it. But this is a personal, intimate time with just me and God. Now, there's a reason why God wants you to pray in a closet. You see, he wants you to pray in private because prayer is meant to be a time of intimacy with God. In fact, I want you to notice the last clause in verse number 6. Notice what it says. Pray to your Father, which is in secret. Now, what did he mean by pray to your Father, which is in secret? Well, the word secret is translated from the Greek word kryptos, which means private. And this is a reference to Psalm 91.1. How many of you are familiar with the book of Psalm chapter 91? Wonderful, wonderful chapter. In fact, if you can, I'd memorize the whole chapter, and I would recite it over your children when they're infants. Seriously. But don't make it a time of hypocrisy. But anyways, this is a reference to Psalm chapter 91, verse 1. Notice what it says. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High. Ooh. He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Now, listen to me. God doesn't go into a secret place in order to hide. In fact, he doesn't need to hide from anyone or for anything. He's God. He's God. He's not scared. He's not afraid. He's not ashamed. He's not embarrassed. He made everything. And as a result of that, God does not go to a secret place in order to hide. So what is God's secret place? Because those who dwell in the secret place of the Most High. Ooh, what is his secret place? Well, the phrase secret place refers to an intimate place where two people go in order to be alone. In fact, most lovers have a secret place. It's a place where they go and they can be alone with each other and not get caught. Yeah, let's be honest. You know, when we think of lovers sometimes, we don't think of it in an innocent way. We think of someone that's cheating or someone that's going on. And, and it's true. When someone's cheating, what do they do? They look for a secret place. It's a place where they can go and be alone with each other and not get caught. But, of course, in the Bible, this is referring to it in a positive way, in innocence. So what Jesus is telling us to do is he's telling us to go to a private place so that we can be alone with God and not get caught. We don't want to get caught by people interrupting us. We don't want to get caught by the things that are going on. We want to go and hide and be in a secret place with God so we can be alone with him and not be caught. Now, your secret place is where you go in order to be alone with God and not get caught. You see, prayer is supposed to be a time when you go into the Holy of Holies with God to be alone with him. No one else but you and God. And you know what's interesting? God has a secret place for each one of us. Because he's omnipotent, omniscient, omnipresent, God can speak to everyone on this earth in a secret place. It's like he's just alone with them. And so what he's telling you is you get the opportunity to choose what your secret place is. If it's truly a closet, 
Maybe you have a small home, but it's a walk-in closet. If you have to go into the closet and close that door, pretty soon everyone knows that if you go into that closet, you're praying. Or if it's in an office or your den, wherever it is, this is my closet. This is where I go. And my staff knows that they're not to interrupt me. Because this is a time for me to get along with God and not get caught by people. Not get caught with interruptions. It's kind of interesting, but John and Charles Wesley, their mother had 13 children. Where in the world can a mother go and not get caught? Do you know what she taught her children? Because she was a strong woman of prayer, and that's why two of her sons went in and made such an impact on the world for Christianity. She taught every one of her children, because she had an apron, that when she sat down and she put the apron over her head, she was in her closet and she was not to be interrupted. They were not to get in trouble. They were not to make noise. And her children learned because there was no place where she could go to be alone. Some of you mothers know that. You can't even go to the bathroom without seeing your little toddler stick their hand underneath the door, wiggle those fingers, say, Mom! Mom! Maybe the bathroom should be your closet. I don't know. But here's what's sad. The hypocrite doesn't want to meet with God in private. No. His goal is not to spend time with God alone. His goal is to put on a performance for others. Now, let me make a bold statement because we need to apply this. And many times we'll listen to sermons like this, but we don't ever make any application. But this application might offend you. And I don't care. Here goes. If the only time you pray is before meals and at nighttime with your children before you put them in bed and you don't have a personal prayer time with God where it's just you and him, you are a hypocrite. Your prayer time before meals and your prayer time with your children is just an act. Now, I'm not saying that you should stop praying before your meals, and I'm not saying you should stop praying with your kids before you put them in bed. No, you need to do that. But what I'm saying is that you need to have your own personal prayer time with God, and if you don't, then praying with your kids and with your kids at night is just an act. You're just a hypocrite. You're pretending to be someone or something that you're not. You're pretending in front of your family that you're this great man of God and that you're leading them as a Christian and you and God are like this. And so you pray before the meals and then when they go to bed, you pray with them. And then you never pray any other time. People, that's just an act. And pretty soon your kids are going to figure that out and they're going to realize it's not real. He's just pretending. You need to remember that God expects you to pray. That's why Jesus started off with this implication. And we can infer from his implication that we're expected to pray. He said, when you pray. Because he was expecting you to pray. But he also expects your prayer time to be personal and intimate. A time when you are alone with God. Just you and him. And trust me, I know you say you like to fish because you're out on that boat. And it's just you and God on the lake. I will believe you when you put that fishing rod down so you don't get caught, or in other words, you don't catch a fish. When you put that fishing pole down, and you're in the middle of the lake, and you're down on your knees where you can be alone with God, then I'll buy that. But I don't buy it when you're praying to God and flipping it out. And, and then you get caught in the middle of it as you got a big one. Everyone with me? All right. Now, in verses 7 and 8, Jesus continues talking about prayer, but he switches to another problem that most people have when it comes to prayer, and that's superstition. Believe it or not, we think we're not superstitious, but the majority of us are. You see, in verses 5 and 6, Jesus is talking about hypocrisy. But in verses 7 and 8, he starts talking about superstition. Because superstition can ruin a person's prayer life just as much as hypocrisy can. So let's read verses 7 and 8. But when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. For they think that they should be heard for their much speaking. Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. Now I want you to notice that Jesus did not say, use not vain repetitions as the hypocrites do. No, he's not talking about hypocr hypocrisy now. He's talking about superstition. So Jesus said this, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. 
And the word heathen is translated from the Greek word ethnikos. And ethnikos means Gentile. In fact, our English word ethnic is transliterated from this Greek word. So we want to know what ethnicity you are or what ethnic group you come from. We're wanting to know what group of people. But you, don't, you didn't refer to it at that time towards the Jews. So when it used the word ethnikos, it meant the Gentiles. So what Jesus said was this. Use not vain repetitions as the Gentiles do. But what does that mean? Well, let's find out. Look back at the first part of verse 7, and I want you to underline the phrase, vain repetitions. He says, but when you pray, again, here's that same phrase, that means that God expects you to pray. He doesn't say, but if you decide to pray, he said, but when you pray, use not vain repetitions as the heathen do. Now that phrase, vain repetitions, is translated from the Greek word, batalageo, bata. Lageo. And it refers to pagan formulas and magical incantations. You see, the Gentiles believed that prayer worked kind of like a magic spell. They believed that if you said just the right words in just the right way, that that would guarantee that the gods would hear you. Now, the reason I use the word gods, and in my notes I have a little g, is because they were polytheistic. They weren't pantheists where they believed that everything was kind of tied into this Godhead. That's a pantheist. Polytheist, polytheistic means that they believed that there were a multitude of gods. If you've ever studied Greek mythology and then you can study all the other nations and the, myth, myth, uh, the myths that they had, their mythology, you'll find out that the majority believed that there were all different kinds of gods. And so they believed that if you said just the right words in just the right way, it guaranteed that the gods heard you. In fact, the pagan police, police, priest believed that if you didn't say just the right words in just the right way, then the gods would not honor your prayers. So they came up with different incantations for different needs. Now, everyone knows what I mean by incantation, right? An incantation is a magic spell. It's a special set of words that have magical powers if you say the words in just the right way. So, that's what batalageo means. It refers to incantations. In fact, the phrase abracadabra is a bato or batalageo. It's an incantation. How many of you remember growing up and watching a magician? And right before he performed the, the uh, magic of, of maybe making something disappear or something appear, what would he say? Abracadabra. As if those words were magic and that made something happen. Well, that's actually a bato lageo, what he's talking about. Well, the Jews fell into the very same trap. Somehow they got into their head that if they said just the right words and just the right way, their prayers would be answered by God. So instead of praying from the heart, they started scripting prayers, memorizing them. And then when it came time for prayer, they would recite them Word for word. That's how all of the Jews came to the point where they started. And, you know, when we read the Shema, we go, that's not a prayer. They turned it into a prayer. They memorized it when it was time to pray. That was what they prayed. So when the trumpet sounded, signifying that it was time for the sacrifices and the fixed time of prayer, instead of it coming from their hearts, they would recite it. The Shema, parts 1, 2, and 3. And they could actually be thinking about something else because they recited it three times a day, every day. And by doing that, it was ingrained within them. They recited Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 through 9. Deuteronomy chapter 11, verses 13 through 21. And Numbers chapter 15, verses 37 through 41. And they recited these passages of Scripture word for word because if you didn't say the right words in the right way, then God wouldn't hear you. And if he didn't hear you, he wouldn't bless that. And that's why they did it. In fact, the Pharisees believed that if they didn't recite the Shema word for word, then God would get angry at them. Now, the problem with that was twofold. First of all, they were putting their faith into the words they were saying and not in the God that they were praying to. And secondly, their prayers were repetitious and not from the heart. As I said, 
They memorized these prayers so they could rip them off without even thinking about what they were saying. And some of you are like that. You wonder why your prayer time is not fresh. You wonder why it's not reinvigorating. You wonder why it doesn't excite you. It's because probably you have gotten into this uh, point where you can pray without even thinking about it. You just blurting it out the same things. It's almost like it's memorized. So their prayer time was nothing more than vain repetition. And that's why Jesus said in verse number 8, Be not ye therefore like unto them, for your Father knoweth what things you have need of before you ask him. People, God knows what you need. So what he wants is he wants your prayer time to be personal and from the heart and not canned because of a superstition that if you don't pray it, with the right words, in the right way, then you're not going to get your prayers answered. Now, I'll be honest with you, we can apply this in so many different ways. Some of you don't like the way that we do altar calls here. Because you grew up in a church where you always had people walk down to the front. And here, when I do an altar call, I have everyone bow their heads, close their eyes. And I say, if you'd like to receive Jesus, you just repeat this prayer after me. And I say a prayer, and if they repeat it, and then after I finish doing I say, if you said that prayer... For the first time, and you meant it, I want you to raise your hand. No one's looking but me. And I'll have some people raise their hand. Now, invariably, because I've been doing this ever since I started the church, I'll have someone who comes up to me and says, I don't believe that's the right way to do an altar call. Well, what do you mean? Well, I believe that if someone's going to get saved, they need to walk down that aisle. You see, we've been ingrained to believe that if you don't walk down that aisle then God's not going to take it seriously and that person's not really going to be saved. And so we get to thinking that, you know, to be saved, you've got to go to church, you've got to walk down that aisle. So I purposely don't do that, and I'll tell you why. You should be sharing the gospel with your friends, with your co-workers, with your recreational partners, wherever you go, whatever you do, you should be sharing the gospel, and you should know within your heart that you can lead that person to Jesus. In fact, let me go a little bit further. I've had people email me and say, could you send me a copy of the sinner's prayer? Ah! There is no copy of the sinner's prayer. If there is... That's just a bunch of religious hogwash. Let me tell you, it's what you do in your heart. God knows what you have need of. And if you need him, he knows when you say, Jesus, save me. And that can be it. If you believe that Jesus died for your sins and that God raised him from the dead when all of your sins were paid for, and you want him to be Lord of your life, and you say, Jesus, save me, Jesus, save me, gets you saved. You know, it's so neat. Tim Baker sent me a little note he'd posted on Facebook, but he sent me a little personal email and said, I was so proud of my grandson. He was taking surfing lessons, and I, if I'm remembering right, it was in Hawaii, and there's a young man with him, and he started sharing Jesus Christ with him. And there on the surfboards, he led him to Jesus Christ. That's what it's all about. It's not about walking down an aisle. It's not about saying the right thing. I've heard people... I've actually had people come to my office and tell me, I'm not sure I'm saved. I'm not sure I said it right. Said it right? Honey, God knows what you need without you ever saying it. So when you come and you tell him, Jesus, I need you. Let me tell you, if you believe he died for your sins and God raised him from the dead, and you want him to be Lord of your life, when you say, Jesus, I need you, bam, you're saved. Because God looks at the heart. We've gotten so carried away into superstition that you've got to say the right words in just the right way. We are just like the heathens and the pagans. Let me tell you, they have a book of incantations. These are magic spells that if you say the right words in just the right way, then this is what's going to happen. Let me tell you, God doesn't work that way. God gets alone with you in your closet and when you come to him and you're sincere and you start talking about your children and how much you love them and God you know that compared to you I'm an evil father. So God I know you love my kids even more so I can't be there all the time but you're always there with them. God you bring the right friends across their path. Don't let them be carried away with the wrong kind of friends because I know The bad morals corrupts good communication, corrupts us, 
If we get with the wrong people, then we're going to start acting the wrong way. God, bring my, my children good friends. And you start praying from the heart, let me tell you what happens. God starts answering those prayers. You know, there's a book that's, that's, that's entitled Prayers That Avail Much. And people will buy that. And, and, and don't get me wrong, if you buy them for the right reason, they'll give you scriptures over certain things. And that is good. But that's just to let you know what the Word of God promises. And when the Bible tells us to remind God of the promises, it's not because God is forgetful. It's because when we remind God of what His Word says, what it means is we're standing on faith. God, your Word says this, and I believe it. And I thank you that you're going to work this way in this area of my life. Now, once you understand this, we're now ready to go to the Lord's Prayer. And that's what we're going to be studying next week. Verses 9 through 13. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And I use the Augustinian Lord's Prayer if you don't mind. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespassed against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the glory, and the power. And those are three different things, not synonyms. Forever and ever. Amen and amen. And that's what we're going to study next week. But the first thing we have to understand is God expects us to pray. And he expects it to be a personal and intimate time with him. So we go to our closet. And he doesn't want us to get into superstition. Because God is not a superstitious God. We don't have to say it the right way or say the right words in the right way. We have to share our heart. And when you get where you're praying with a sincere heart, you're going to see the miraculous works of God.